Well, I'd uh, like to thank the organisers for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, very timely uh, dialogue. There is something deeply ironic about President Biden's Summit for Democracy next week. Convened by the United States in order to promote the case for Western-style democracy, it takes place at a time when democracy in the United States itself has never been weaker or more under threat, certainly not since the Civil War. It is almost as if the insurrection at Capitol Hill earlier this year had never taken place, that it was just a bad dream. There are two profound problems in the West's concept of democracy. The first is the lack of any serious historical context. And the second is the failure to understand and respect cultural difference. First, the historical context. In the Western mind, democracy has been elevated to, has been elevated from a political form specific to its time and place to a universal form for all times and in all countries. In so doing, any sense of historical context has been lost. Such a mindset is profoundly flawed. No political form is eternal. All are a product of their time and circumstances. Western democracy is no exception. Its future, even in the West itself, is neither certain nor guaranteed. The idea that Western-style democracy is permanent rests on a belief that the fundamental conditions that have sustained it in the West over the last 70 years, longer of course in the case of the US and the UK, will continue indefinitely. It is becoming increasingly clear that this cannot be assumed. Democracy in a range of Western countries is not in good health. It is in a worse condition than at any time since the 1930s. We should remind ourselves that democracy has only been dominant in the West since 1945. During the interwar period, 1918 to 1939, democracy was confined, at least in Europe, to a very small number of countries. As the great historian Eric Hobsbawm has pointed out, the only European countries to have functioning democratic political institutions which managed to survive for the entire period between 1918 18 and 1939 were the UK, Finland, the Irish Free State, Sweden and Switzerland. These countries contain a very small minority of Europe's population. The great majority lived under various forms of dictatorship for part, most or all of that period. There were many reasons why democracy was sparse, but the most important was the catastrophic effects and consequences of the Great Depression, which created the conditions for fascism and undermined those for democracy. In direct contrast, the main reason for the success of Western democracy after the Second World War was the long boom from 1945 until the mid 70s, after which growth continued, but at a much lower pace until 2007. The financial crisis in 2008 marked a major turning point. It led to growing dissolution in the governing elites and institutions in many Western countries, including the US, UK, Italy, France, and Greece. The most dramatic example was the United States. With the rise of Trump, growing divisions, polarization, the rise of populism and nationalism, and hostility towards established elites. The Bennett Institute for Public Policy in Cambridge has recorded a growing crisis of democracy in the Anglo-Saxon countries, with those dissatisfied with the performance of democracy doubling since 1995. 
As the Western economies continue their relative decline, as they certainly will, it seems highly likely that such dissatisfaction will continue to grow. Even the future of US democracy, long the bastion of Western democracy, is now far from certain. The US has been on the rise for virtually its whole existence, an extraordinary fact. This has given its governing system great prestige and authority. But what happens when the opposite is the case? When the US finds itself in an unending process of relative decline, because that is what the future holds. Will American democracy survive in far less inclement circumstances? The early signs are not too encouraging. Let me put this point in a different way. Ultimately, ultimately whatever the form of government, it has to deliver on behalf of its people. This is the bottom line. If it can't deliver, then sooner or later it will be replaced. This is the crucial problem now faced by Western democracies. Increasingly, they have been unable to deliver. Whatever, whatever the fancy talk about democracy, the acid test is the ability to, to, to deliver, to enhance the living standards and lives of the people. This is exactly where the, where the, where the Western democracies are now failing and China, in stark contrast, is delivering. The Chinese governing system has proved much superior in delivering results over the last 40 years than the Western style democratic system. This brings me to my second general point, cultural difference. The West has always regarded, regarded its model of governance to be universally applicable. Wherever the country might be, and whatever its history and culture, one size fits all. The classic example was the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The imposition of an entirely alien form of governance on a country that culturally and historically was profoundly different. But this abortive mission was no accident or isolated incident. The same basic philosophy had informed the colonial empires of Britain, France, the Netherlands, and other European powers in the 19th century and, uh, and earlier. The European powers sought to impose their will, their religion, their customs, and their fiat in whatever ter territory they could seize, including China, all in the name of civilizing the uncivilized. Invasion and intervention in the name of democracy is but the latest example. If a state has, in the US's view, an illegitimate form of governance, then it believes it has the right to intervene in order to impose its own version of democracy. So the right of every country to sovereignty and its right to choose is, in the eyes of the US, conditional upon what choice it makes. Remember, too, that the West's conception of democracy is solely confined to the nation state. It has no application outside the nation state, for example, crucially, in the international realm. That is why the term democracy is never used by the West in the context of the international system. And this is why the latter is devoid of democracy. The United States is the architect and keeper of the international system, and it believes it has the right to act unilaterally whenever and wherever it wants. The West now represents less than 15% of the world's population, and yet it is by far the dominant player in the international system. Any notion of democracy is regarded as irrelevant and inapplicable to the international system. Let us, let us return to the nation state. Far from the monolithic approach favoured by the West, where countries are expected to conform to the Western norm of governance. In the reality, of course, the world embraces a huge variety of different histories, cultures, and forms of governance. 
The failure to recognize and respect this has inflicted huge damage on many countries. Take China. As Francis Fukuyama has rightly argued, the governing system in China has been characterized by an extraordinary continuity over a period of two millennia, far greater than that in any other country. This is one of the reasons why Chinese governance is so remarkable and so effective. It has very deep roots, far deeper than those of any Western system of governance. Successful governance is not about transplanting an abstract set of rules and procedures from one country and applying it to an entirely different environment and set of circumstances somewhere else. Democracy means respecting the culture and traditions of a country, allowing governance to grow and flower in its own indigenous conditions. Thank you very much. Um, well, I've, I've got two points to make about this question. Uh, the first is that um, why, has, why have attitudes in the West grown a lot more negative over the last few years towards China? This is a truth. This is, a, this is absolutely true. Uh, China has become, over the last five years in my own country and even more in the United States, uh, often a toxic subject. And I don't think uh, it's very difficult to understand what's happened. I mean, there was a period when uh, between, I would say, the turn of the century, late 90s, until, let's say, 2015, when actually in the West, attitudes towards China were becoming more open, more curious, more interested, um, and more optimistic. What was the turning point? The turning point was the election of Trump in 2016. The whole attitude in the West, starting with the United States, became increasingly toxic towards China. Every attempt has been made to demonize China in lots of different ways. I mean, this, this has been like a Cold War assault. And it's certainly true in my own country, in the UK. I can, you know, right across the board, more or less, even including the sort of leftist liberal papers, have become more critical of China. So this is not something particularly that is, you know, China's change. I mean, China's changed in certain ways. Yes, it's grown, it's more powerful in the world. But this attempt to degenerate, de de uh, denigrate China um, is very important uh, in, in relationship to this. And you didn't mention that. And I think that you therefore, you know, I understand your point, but you give, I think, a not an accurate picture. The second point I want to make is about China and openness. Yeah, I do think China's got a problem about a lack of openness and a lack of transparency. Um, it's certainly in that sense different from the West. And I think that as China becomes more important in the world, as it becomes a, you know, increasingly a sort of major power in the world or great, a great power in the world, then one of the things that goes with that power is the need uh, for more openness. Um, that, that, that seems to me to be something that China needs to confront. How does it deal with what well, the, the tennis player is a, a case in point? Because now there's a great international debate and China is silent about it. Uh, I, personally, I'm skeptical about a lot of the Western attitudes and criticisms uh, on this question, but China's voice is completely absent. And I don't think that is good for China. The second thing I'd say in relationship to this is also China's still, I think, got quite a way to go to learn how to interact with Western opinion. Um, it's still a novice, relatively speaking, in relationship to that. And so the effectiveness of China's uh, 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 response, for example, to the changed mood in the West, starting with Trump, has not been nearly as effective as it might have been. Thank you.